Hello, my name is Stiley Hayward. I would like to welcome you to the Blessed Hope Ministry. We are a King James grounded family Bible study. These lessons are not to be a substitute for regular church attendance. Nightly I direct my family through the Bible by chapter and verse. We request you to join us and to study from God and His Son Jesus Christ. You may have permission to like, send, or encourage our studies with family or friends. Edification of what God has and what He desires in our life. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You may use our studies, but I request that you do not abuse them. For YouTube videos, subscribe below for more videos. And place the thumbs up and leave a comment or email me. Thank you. Genesis chapter 15. And Joseph fell upon his father's face, and wept upon him, and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians, the physicians embalmed Israel. Now we'll go to chapter 50, verse 26. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him. This is the only two recorded embalmments in the Bible. And it's not particularly so with the Jewish people. It would be haphazard if they had bombed Lazarus. Lazarus come out of the grave, he ain't got no stomach, he ain't got no brains, he ain't got no internal parts. He'd be in trouble. What more say about Jesus if they were to embalm him before his death? I mean, before his burial. It's an Egyptian worldly practice. It's not customary for the Jews. And here recorded, Joseph and Jacob are embalmed. Forty days were fulfilled for him. For so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. So forty days of embalming. Forty is a, is a Bible number of testing, temptation, trial. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. Sixty, seventy days. Jacob had such a respect of the Egyptians that they mourned his death. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in thy eyes, you know, he's getting permission. He's the second ruler, but he still needs permission. And we need to learn that lesson as Christians. There are things that the government has set for us, both government, both state, municipal, that we need permission. We can't just go out and do something and say, well, you know, it's my property, it's my land, and no. Romans 13 gives us that we are to obey the powers that be. I pray you, Pharaoh I mean, saying, now if I found grace in thy, if I found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, so he's getting permission, he's not going to do anything on a whim, my father made me swear, saying, lo, I die, in my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Cana, there shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father according as he made thee swear. Look at, look at this Pharaoh. Yeah, go. Take care of him. Leave the land with your family. Do what your father has told you. This Pharaoh is working with the Jews. I will bless them that bless you. This Pharaoh has survived seven years of famine because of his conduct through the Jews. And he's still living. <clears throat> Joseph went up to bury his father. And with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh. As I said, Jacob is so respected by Pharaoh the royal servants of Egypt are attending the funeral 
Jacob's funeral procession is made up of royalty. Of Egyptians. The elders of his house. And all the elders of the land of Egypt. Royalty. Now I don't know what the what the palace of Pharaoh was called. Like you know, we know the White House and the Kremlin and all that. But everybody that's under Pharaoh is attending this funeral because of Jacob and because of Joseph and all the house of Joseph and his brethren. Now it says the house of Joseph because we got that blessing, in chapter forty-nine. The firstborn blessing goes on Joseph. So now Joseph is put in charge of the whole family. His brothers and all their wives and all their children and his children and his wife. And before I forget, we close off Genesis 50. Joseph is ruler of Egypt. He has saved the Egyptians seven years of famine. The famine has come to the end. They're growing crops. They, they got to give certain to uh, Pharaoh. He's been blessed by his father. He has seen his father. He's alive. They're both happy. He's witnessed the death of his father. And there's only one conclusion I come to in Genesis 50. It's kind of comical, but you got to think about it. You ever wonder what ever happened to Potiphar's wife? You know jo uh, Joseph never treated anybody with misjustice. So she would come from Gorn. She would have to bow down before the man she lied about. And I'm saying that right now because the entire household of Pharaoh has seen Joseph, forget Jacob for a minute, has seen Joseph faithful in everything that he's done. Now, we go back here, if we can remember what chapter it is. We go back back here, part of where he first shows up. And there's something that's quite interesting. Oh. All right, verse 30, chapter 39, verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian. This would be the one of the men that would show up with Jacob's funeral. He is under Pharaoh of the royalty of Pharaoh. And he's got to look at his wife like, you know what? You're a liar. That's not the Joseph we know. That man has been so faithful. He's been faithful with a lot more women than you, babe. So we see an untold story about Potiphar's wife. Or the other half is he just, you know, I don't care what everybody else says. Joseph is a, you know, he's an adulterer. He's a thief. He's a mocker. You know, we, we don't ever hear about Potiphar and his wife no more. What happened? And we're, because we're going to see a remarkable story about the brothers in a minute. So the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the house of Joseph and his brethren, his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. So someone took care of their children. They left them in a kind of what we would say a daycare. Here we're going to a funeral. We take care of our kids. The animals need to be fed. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. Now, okay, let's get the picture here now. With the passing of Jacob and Joseph leading a, a, a funeral procession. There are Egyptian horses and chariots. Okay. You know the next time Israel sees this. Is they are by the Red Sea. And those horses and chariots are coming to get them back. And, there, and they came to the threshing floor of Atad, they're going east, 
which is beyond Jordan. Now that's, they go from Egypt all the way to the other side of the Jordan River. That's a long journey. And there they mourn with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days, a week long, after they get over the Jordan River. Remember, these are the ones that say we don't like Hebrews and we don't like shepherds. Remember that. Joseph and his father and his family had made a great character of the Egyptians. So that when we read in Exodus, there rose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. What is that statement? The character of Joseph's family was remarkable. We hate them Hebrews. We can't stand their God. We disprove of shepherds. Jacob's died? Yeah, Joseph's father. But let's, let's get all the horses and the chariots. Let's go with him. Let's, let's go weep with him. Let's go stand by his side, even though we hate him. They're an abomination. And the Bible records in the millennium that the Gentiles are going to grab a hold of a Jew and say, Hey, we're going to go with you because God is with you. We want to learn from God. Isn't that interesting? And the Bible so mentions that if Egypt does not come, they're not going to get rain. Gentiles will grab a hold of the Jews in the millennium and say, You take us to your Messiah. You are of him, being Jewish. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atab, they said, This is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Now, there are more Egyptians than there are Israelis. They see a bunch of colored folks with the Egyptian attire, and they're like, wow, it's the Egyptians they're here. Now, what? Wherefore, the name is called Abel Mezrum. Mezrum means Egypt. That's the Canaanite word for Egypt. There it is, Mezrum. Which is beyond Jordan, the other side of the Jordan River. And his sons did unto him according as he commanded them. They're listening to Joseph. Whatever they're doing, they're doing. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan. Now, they go across the Jordan River. Now they're going to cross back into the Jordan River. And we're going to go to Mamre, where the burying place is. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the Canaan of the field of Mechavah, which Abraham bought with a field for a possession of the burying place of Ephraim, the Hittite, before memory. The only one that's not buried in there is Rachel. Why did they go all the way over to Jordan River and back? I don't know. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father. After he had buried his father. Everybody comes home. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead. They said. Joseph will pre-adventure hate us. And will certainly requite. Pay back. Us all the evil which we did unto him. You know when you've done something wrong. Your conscience works on you. And they sent a messenger. Unto Joseph saying. Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph. Now, there's no word this is recorded, so I don't know. Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. Were those wounds in thy hands? Well, they were wounded in, 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 amongst my friends. You mean we're the ones that killed you? Yes. Oh, Jesus, we're sorry. We never knew that you were the Messiah. You were our hope. Lord God, Jesus, forgive us. That's going to happen at the second advent. I don't care what you say. Well, you know, who killed, the, who killed Jesus? 
He, Jesus died himself. Uh, the Romans killed Jesus. The Jews killed Jesus. According to the scriptures of the Old Testament, the Jews killed Jesus because it was written. That land that was sacrificed on the Exodus night did not kill himself. And John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. That Lamb was killed by the Jews. If Rome had killed Jesus, our salvation would not have been sent because there was no men of Egypt called to kill that lamb. It was called of Jewish people. And when the Jews did not kill Jesus, remarkably, their mouth, as much as Joab killed, I believe it was Abishai, as much as Ahab is charged with the death of Naboth, and he did not do one thing. The Jews say, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us. The call of the murder of Jesus is upon them. Yes, he's God. And that's one of those things upon the cross of his death you can't explain like the Trinity. But the charge is the Jews. Why would there be a time called Jacob's trouble? Because they've done everything they could to get rid of God. By nailing him to the cross. Even Jesus said to himself, there was a there was a certain man, he made a vineyard, planted, put a put a tower in it, he made a wine press, he, he put a wall about, he went off to a far com country, he sent his prophets to get of the men, the workers, the husbandmen, and they beat one and they killed another and they stoned another one, they sent another one empty. I will send my son, they will regard my son. When they saw the son, they said, This is our inheritance, let us kill him. What are you going to do with that? When God said the, the husbandman killed Jesus. And here they are repenting. And you got the other half of it. They wanted Joseph dead, but they did not kill him. And Joseph didn't die. Type doesn't go all the way. But their heart was to kill him. Had not Reuben stepped in. I mean, not Reuben, Judah. I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren, twelve tribes, to Jesus, their sin, all have sinned, come short of the glory of God, and they did for the for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spank unto him. Imagine that moment when Jesus comes, he comes to the raiment of the Jew, and they're sorry, and they're repentant. They want to get right, and finally Jesus says, finally, my brethren. See, John 1 said, he came on his own, his own received him not. Let's put it to the second advent. He came on to his own, and his own received him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. Second advent. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants, the nation of Israel, the twelve sons, well, eleven, coming to Joseph. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. That's what Jesus kept saying. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. That's the words of Jesus Christ. Fear not. And you know, the storms. Kept telling the disciples, kept telling the disciples, kept telling the disciples, fear not, fear not. For I am in, for am I in the place of God, and again, that Joseph type, you can't take it all away, but Jesus can say, yeah, I am God. The Jehovah Witnesses would love that verse. But Jesus, who is God, says, I am the Father, and the Father is me. Thomas would say, my Lord, my God. Joseph is a sinner. Jesus was not. But as for you, Jesus, yeah, okay. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. Let's go to Matthew 5, 44. Matthew 5, 44.
He said unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them, which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his sun to shine on the evil and on the good, and sendeth the rain on the just and on the unjust. They've done you wrong, Joseph. You got the character to forgive him, and he does. You thought evil against me. See the thought there? You see the charge of the thought? You need to think. You don't have to do. Thought. Thinking is also a verb. You gotta learn you gotta learn your English language when it comes to the Bible. We will be charged for verbing. I don't know if that's a word, but it ought to be a word. Everything we do. But God meant it unto good. The Jews crucified Jesus Christ with agony and pain and just torture. Isaiah 53. And God meant it for our good, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That Jesus Christ is the gift of God, eternal life. The Jews wanted to get rid of him. And God said, I'll let you get rid of him, but he's going to feed you during the famine, Joseph. He's going to give you eternal life, Jesus Christ. How's that? And they both have bread. Joseph has the physical bread. Jesus Christ has the spiritual eternal bread. It's good to pass, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Everything that happened to Joseph happened because there were people who needed to be saved. You hear what I said? People alive. It was absolute torture and terror what they did to Jesus, but it needed to be saved for much people, not all people, to be alive. I'm alive. If I take my last breath, Paul says, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, I will live the whole eternity. The Bible never calls a man that dies and goes to hell eternal life. Though you got eternal life, but the Bible never calls it. It says it's the wrath of God. But eternal life is one that has done what God has said, and then when you die, you're taken care of. They wanted to get rid of Jesus, but that needed to be done. Somebody needed to, to sell Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, for 30 pieces of silver, and Judah said, I'll do it. You don't have to do it, Jewish. Oh, I want to do it. Sign me up. To save much people. Now the Bible never says everyone's going to be saved. I am saved by the bread of life. The people in Egypt were saved by the bread of physical. And this is a great verse here from Romans 8.28. Now therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you. And in the millennium, Jesus is going to feed the Jew. He will be their king. David will be resurrected. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. What, what a glorious revival. Their pitch fear of what Joseph's going to do to them now. He puts his arms around and says, listen, we're brothers. I knew what your evil heart did. But I know what God did. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he in his father's house. And Joseph lived a hundred and ten years. But when we first saw him, we gave him an age was seventeen. Ninety something years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Micah, the son of Manasseh were brought up upon Joseph's knees. He bounced his, his grandchildren on his knees. That's what the Bible is saying. 
And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. And now he becomes a prophet. God will surely visit you. Later with Moses. And bring you out of this land unto a land which he swear to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Now at this point you're thinking, well, why would we want to leave? It's great here. We haven't got to the Exodus yet. And this is not their land. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. He's carried out in Exodus 13:19. For some Christians, you're going to die. They're going to put you in a coffin in the world. But you have an exodus coming. Now some things. God does not want us in Egypt and does not want us to stay in Egypt. Joseph's name appears on Egyptian coins. Archaeologists found. So there was a Jewish. There is archaeological evidence of the Bible. Rest assured. 